coming up next on Passion Struck. So many people who are probably listening to this right now think that courage means jumping out of airplanes or quitting jobs and moving to other countries and making these massive shifts. When really, sometimes it's the micro challenges, the micro aspects of courage that, first of all, are sometimes the hardest, but they can also move the needle even the most. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles, and on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. I am absolutely thrilled to have Scott Simon on passion struck. Welcome, Scott. John, thanks so much for having me. Great to be with you. Well, today we're going to discuss your incredible book, which I'm holding up right here. Scare your soul, seven powerful principles to harness fear and lead your most courageous life. And I will just start off by telling you What I told you before we even got on the air that oftentimes I pick up books and they have a lot of great information, but it's not really applicable. And when I started reading the reviews about your book, again and again, people would say it's a book you not only read, it's a book you end up living. And I found it so true when I picked it up myself. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, I really wanted to make this book very much of a conversation between me and the reader. And anybody that has listened to your podcast knows that when it comes to happiness and flourishing lives and leading a courageous life, there's no top 10 list that you can get accomplished in the next week. So it's really about the work, the self-awareness, the passion. And I hope that the book really becomes that, that workbook, that Bible that people can go back to over and over again to reconnect with their best selves. Well, one of my favorite sayings and a friend of mine rory vaden is the one who i first heard say it is we are most positioned to serve the person that we once were and our parents and our entire upbringing greatly influence who we become and create some of the biggest hurdles that we have to deal with i understand you've faced many hurdles and challenges and i was hoping that you could talk about that because i think it's a great starting point because regardless of what you went through, other people face these stumbling blocks that get them stuck in life. Well, first of all, I think that's absolutely true. We all have our own journey, our own path, and our own stumbles. And for me, it really was the fact that I grew up, first of all, in a very loving family, very lucky to have great parents and grandparents, but I was shy, I was short, and and I was the victim of bullies. And that led me to want to lead or to feel that I needed to lead a very small life, really in fear. And that stuck with me through my entire childhood. I couldn't speak in front of more than five or six people at a time, certainly couldn't raise my hand in class and answer a question. So I struggled in school, I had to switch schools. And really the bullying was the worst. That was what really made me feel unsafe, unsafe to be myself in so many ways. So when I look at who I am today, the kind of things that I get to do, the things that we're doing right now, where I get to talk about the things that I went through, I really believe that it's a mirror to what everybody else has gone through in their lives I just want to make sure it doesn't hold us back, that we somehow can take action in fun and lively and powerful ways that we can actually overcome those things that used to hold us back. And for me, boy, did I feel held back. (laughs) Well, I find that many of our destructive behaviors take root in an emotional void, an emptiness that calls out for something to fill it. Is that how you felt when you described yourself as wanting to be invisible? Absolutely. To me, it felt like a huge void. I wasn't able to speak. I wasn't able to communicate for myself. 
and really showing up in any kind of real way just felt unsafe for anybody that's been bullied. The more you speak out, the more that you fight back, the more unsafe you might feel, whether it's true or not as a kid. And for me, I was eight, nine, 10, when I was getting tossed around in circles and thrown off into the bushes in front of everybody in my grade, really tough stuff for a young child to, to go through. And yes, it was a void of purpose. It was a void of feeling like I just didn't have a voice. Yeah, and I wanted to keep going down this path just for a little bit longer. What are some of the ways that people blind themselves to the truth about their fears? Oh, gosh, I think there are so many ways that we all feel like we can help other people is we have this clarity of vision when somebody else tells us their problems. But trauma and negative past experiences sometimes are so deeply buried in our subconscious that we sometimes don't even remember or are not present to the fact that they even happened. Couple that with the fact that fear, when it reaches our eyes and our brains, when we have a stimulus of something that's causing fear, it happens so quickly. It happens so quickly and our body reacts. So we think that it's normal. We literally think that the reaction that we're having is exactly the reaction that we should be having. When in looking at somebody else in their life, we're able to have a sense of perspective. So much of the work that I feel like I do helping people become more courageous, and certainly as we create courage challenges that we do every single week and Scare Your Soul, it's about slowing down, paying attention to your body, paying attention to what's happening in your body, and making decisions about stepping forward into maybe a moment of discomfort, maybe a moment of being scared, but doing something that at the end of the day will enliven us and lead us to a more flourishing life. Yeah, and on those lines of a flourishing life, because that is exactly what I'm trying to help guide people do on Passion Struck. How do our fears lead us to live a life that is less fulfilling than the one that we dream is possible? Because I think our fears are one of the biggest stuck points that inhabit our being and prevent us from taking those steps. Absolutely. So let me frame fear this way. Let's look at fear in two different ways. In one regard, fear is meant to keep us safe. It's one of the most critical and primal emotions that we have. Anybody that has a child and you counsel them very vigorously not to cross the street, you understand why they need to be afraid to walk across the street. Fear has a deep survival impulse within us. But there are so many fears that are self-generated based on society, the impacts that what we see on social media or what people say to us or tell us, what authority figures have told us in the past or past experiences. And those lead us to be afraid of things like rejection, abandonment, failure, sometimes success, change, the unknown, all of those things that I think we approach every single day. And what I hope to do, and what I hope that I've done in this book, is to really help people map out in their own lives which fears are keeping them safe and which fears are holding them back. And when we remove that barrier and we say, you know what, it may feel a little uncomfortable. For example, one of our famous challenges that we've done hundreds and hundreds of times is buying a cup of coffee for a stranger and having a conversation with that stranger for 30 seconds. It's a very simple challenge. It's fairly low cost, but it puts you in that moment of uncertainty and unknown. And I know you've spoken on your podcast about this many times before, that sometimes those conversations on airplanes, in line at the coffee shop, they may be some of the most important conversations we will ever have. And we just don't know it unless we push through that barrier. So I really believe in so many ways that courage is the key that unlocks so much of what you've talked about with so many of your other guests, the things that make us happy and the things that lead to flourishing lives. Courage to me, if we can get past that moment of uncertainty, leads us into a garden of opportunity. And that to me is, <laughs> I couldn't think of a better way to lead life than to consistently push that edge. It's what motivates me every day. And I think it motivates all the people that are involved in our movement. Well, I always like to ask this question. We all have moments that define who we become. And a guest that I had on last year, Kara Chamberlain, was 16 years old when she was kidnapped 
by what turned out to be a serial killer. And I asked her during the interview how that moment defined her. And I loved her response because she said, that moment hasn't defined me. I can influence so many others because of that, but I don't let it define me. In your case, you decided to jump on a plane to Tel Aviv, speaking about flights. And during that flight, you discovered eight words that ended up changing your life and leading you from being consumed by fear to chasing fear. And I was hoping you could talk about that experience because similar to Kara, you ended up making the choice to not let your early upbringing define the rest of your life. You made the choice to change it. Absolutely. And that moment is something that I will never forget. So I had graduated from college. I had, as I mentioned, a really rough road to get there, even switching colleges because I wasn't doing well and, and struggling socially, et cetera. And I was back working the alternative music aisle at Camelot Records, selling vinyl at 21 years old and staying as safe and invisible as I possibly could be. And I was given an opportunity to travel to Israel for a year as a volunteer to teach English to elderly Holocaust survivors. And I have to be honest with you, I do not know to this day why I said yes, <laughs> because it was so out of the norm for me to literally get on a plane and go to a country where I didn't know the language or anybody and to do something so crazy. But I said yes, and I packed my bag, I gave my parents a big hug, and I hopped on this plane, and I literally had a panic attack. As the flight took off, I started to think to myself, how can I possibly land and turn around? I just literally didn't think I could do it. And in one moment of complete breakdown, I pulled out this little spiral notebook that I had in my backpack and a pen, and I will never forget it. I opened it up and words tumbled out of my pen. And I wrote, do one thing every day that scares you. And I sat there and I looked at it and I knew what it meant. And for me, what that meant was for the next year, not only would I stay and not turn around, but that I would do one thing every day that pushed my comfort zones. It was almost like my year of yes. It was saying yes to all of those things that scared me. And it ended up being the best year of my life. It changed everything for me. And sometimes these things arise out of crisis. Sometimes they arise because we're practicing and we have intention. For me, it was a panic attack on a transatlantic flight that taught me that enough was enough. I had to stop living invisibly and start making choices to push through fear every single day. And that literally changed my life. Yeah, it's interesting. And I'm going to have you talk about some of these here in a second. But last year, I got to interview uh, Victoria Humphreys, who at the age of 50, developed a 50 at 50 challenge where for the next year, she was going to give herself 50 challenges that she had to do. So one a week. So not too far different from you. But I asked her which challenges ended up becoming the most difficult for her. And she said, it wasn't what you expected. The challenges such as jumping out of an airplane became the easiest choices to make. The challenge to go up and talk to a homeless person and serve them or to do a selfless act for her became the more challenging ones. And I wanted to ask you, did you find in yourself the same sort of things happened? Honestly, I could not agree more. I'm so glad you raised that point because so many people who are probably listening to this right now think that courage means jumping out of airplanes or quitting jobs and moving to other countries and making these massive shifts when really it's the micro challenges, the micro aspects of courage that first of all are sometimes the hardest, but they can also move the needle even the most. And for me, that was exactly the case. I remember landing and every day seemed like it presented a challenge, moving in with a new family that I did not know, beginning to speak a language that I didn't know, going to a post office for the first time, connecting with somebody on a bus that I didn't know before. And these little things started to aggregate. They started to, as Alex Korb would say, there was an upward spiral from a feeling of stuckness to a feeling of wow, I get to do something else like this today. And those every single day started to impact me. And to this day, 
so many of our participants in our Scare Your Soul movement and, and really just people who reach out to me after they've read the book say to me, and I literally just got this email this morning, I went to a movie by myself because of you. I cannot tell you how powerful a statement that is to me because it is these little moments of stepping out of our comfort zone that end up changing our lives, not these big gaudy actions. Yes, I've jumped out of airplanes with a fear of heights, but I will tell you very quickly, I honestly believe that getting on a ladder for six straight days and cleaning out your gutters will do more for a fear of heights than jumping out of an airplane at 14,000 feet because it's all about practice, consistency, intention. And I live that life. I'm in some ways a very fearful person because I flirt with my fear every day, but I also, I welcome it every single day. And I think that was what I learned that year in Israel, that year of yes. One of the other events that I was hoping that you could talk about was something that happened that led you to creating a Facebook post that ended up going viral worldwide and led others to picking challenges that were meaningful to them. Sure. So I would ask all of your listeners as I'm telling this to maybe think of one moment in your life when an authority figure told you something that stuck with you. So here's my story. I was 10 years old and I don't know if you remember holiday choir concerts when you were young, but when I went to school, it was a really big thing. The entire grade participated. It was December. I was 10 years old. And uh, we were practicing for our holiday concert. And our substitute choir teacher gave me a solo line in a song. The song was 76 trombones from The Music Man. And I was standing there, front row, shortest kid, little cardigan sweater on and tan khakis. and the song came around to me to sing my solo line and I got choked up. I was so nervous and I couldn't sing the line. And instead of just moving on, he literally started the entire grade over again. I had to endure it again. And the same thing happened. He did it actually one more time. And I was bright red, standing like a statue. And he stormed towards me and said to me, clearly you can't sing. Why don't you just mouth the words for the rest of the year? Now, I will tell you, I don't have a great voice, but what he said to me that day stopped me from singing for 35 years. I would go to concerts with friends and they'd be singing and at the top of their lungs and I would be mouthing the words because what somebody told me when I was 10 years old had an imprint on my soul. And I had gone and gotten a degree in positive psychology and had done some work and gave a TED talk about happiness. And I was really passionate about what does it mean to take our power back and to be courageous in our lives? So I decided one May morning in my mid forties to bring a guitar and to sing in front of a busy restaurant on a Sunday morning. It was a restaurant that had a huge line out front and it was one of the most terrifying moments of my life, grabbing that guitar and walking to this plaza. I opened my guitar case and I began to sing. And first of all, everybody looked insanely annoyed. They were like, why is this guy doing this? But they rallied around me and they saw that I had some enthusiasm. And within five, six minutes, it was over. And I put the guitar in the guitar case and the feeling that I had was a feeling that I had never had before. It was like pure joy and freedom and passion all at once. I came back home and I wrote a Facebook post about it because I thought maybe one or two of my friends might do something the following weekend that pushed their comfort zones in some way. And that post went viral, as you mentioned. It was shared hundreds of times around the world. And the next week I had dozens and dozens of people from countries around the world asking me to help them become more courageous. And that became the basis for what is now an organization called Scare Your Soul, which is this grassroots, free, open movement that just encourages people to do things every single day that push their comfort zones. And then we applaud each other as we do it. It's super simple. But I think the fact that it went viral was my message 
that this is something that's so needed out there. It's so simple, but in some ways we don't do it. And it shocked me that for 35 years, this was something that held me back. And in six minutes, I was able to quell it and I was able to take my power back. And to me, that felt like a really strong statement. So Scare Your Soul Now is all about helping people do just that in their own lives in the ways that feel important and meaningful to them. And it was all about me grabbing a guitar and spending six minutes singing in front of a busy restaurant. I'm going to tell you something very ironic. I, as anyone who knows me, am not a very good singer either. And I'm not sure what possessed me to take on this challenge, but my freshman year in high school, I decided to try out for the school play, Music Man. And I actually was given the role of Winthrop. So I know that song that you were asked to sing extremely <laughs> well, well and because I had to sing it in front of hundreds of people. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly that song is meant to put young kids through their paces. I've told this story obviously many times and it's in the book and I cannot tell you how many people have come up to me and say, I had a choir teacher tell me the same thing, or I had a priest or a rabbi or a faith leader tell me something about how I couldn't do something, or I wasn't good enough to do something, or I should not even try to get into medicals or to become a nurse or to travel and write because they, you just don't have the goods. And what I love about this work is that we take our power back. And again, it's on some level very simple and very actionable, which I love. And on the other hand, because there's a community around it, you're not alone. People are sharing things on social media and they're applauding and joining our Facebook page and our WhatsApp groups where we share one thing every day that scares us. And when you have what my dear friend Maria Sirwa, who is a resilience expert, talks about having a choir, your choir are those people around you that have your back and that always support you. I really look at the Scare Your Soul community and now all the people that are reading the book as shared members of this choir because life is hard, life is challenging, living it together every day. And if we can do these things together and support one another, even if it's different, even if, if your flavor is a little different than mine, then we're really creating massive change both in ourselves and in our communities. And I, I really think across the world. Not sure I've ever even talked about this on the podcast before, but when I was a junior or senior in high school, I was having a one-on-one -on -one session with my English teacher who, if you would go to my classmates and ask them even now, who was one of your favorite teachers you had in high school, it was her. But I remember being in this discussion with her and she ends up telling me that I am never going to amount to anything, that I do not have any potential, that I am not going to do anything in life that's fulfilling. And I remember coming out of that experience, one just being completely humiliated because this was someone I had looked up to so much. But as the weeks went by, it really created this fire inside that I have even today that I'm never gonna let someone tell me something I can't do. So I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's an important lesson for people to hear because I think so many of us encounter people like this who try to limit our potential and we just cannot allow that to happen and influence us. So thank you for bringing that up. I love your concept and agree with it wholeheartedly that sometimes our greatest challenges and oftentimes our greatest challenges become that fuel. And I've had so many people come up to me and say, I'm so sorry for what happened to you when you were young. I'm so sorry that those kids dislocated your arm three times and you didn't tell anybody about it. And I, I say to them, actually, it, it was a huge gift. It didn't feel like it then, but now it fuels me and it gives me the empathy to actually want to help other people. And I think empathy is such an underrated virtue in our world. And when we go through challenges, this is one of those things that most people just don't talk about. When we go through challenges, hard times, I, I went through a divorce and had to become a single parent. I've had many struggles in my own life. And those are the things that make me and fuel me now. And I have so much empathy for other people that are going through them. It makes me want to help, to connect. And that to me is, that's the kind of world that I want to live in. I don't want to live in a world that feels fearful and polarized. What I want are people to connect with one another because we're all going through this together. We're all part of this life together. 
And I really do believe that this whole sense of connectedness through challenge is something that is, as I said before, the key to happiness and flourishing lives. This podcast, as I talked to you before the show, is all about the intentional choices that create positive behavioral change that leads us closer to the dreams we dream of. And you write in the book, and I love this, it is the intentional choice we make to walk into the fire of fear with the hope of growing from its discomfort that creates a flourishing life. I loved it. And I have to say, so many behavioral scientists who've been on this show say the same thing. Why is it that these seemingly mundane choices we make during the transition points in our lives that come between the big mega events have the biggest impact on who our future self becomes? Oh, that's such a great question. So I often use the metaphor of somebody who wants to run a marathon or a triathlon. It's a great goal. It's a goal that takes us mentally and physically to a new level, but you don't do it in a day and you don't do it in a week. What you do is you lace up your shoes every morning and you go out, is it sleeting and snowing or it's raining or it's cold and some days it's warm and sunny and easy, but it's through the consistent practice that you end up finally making it that one day to the starting line. I know that metaphor seems simplistic, but I think the best metaphors and the best realizations in life are sometimes the most simple. I think if we lead our lives pushing ourselves in our mindfulness practice, pushing ourselves into a sense of awe, pushing ourselves to be grateful, pushing ourselves to forgive. And, and for a lot of us, some of the most challenging work we can do is actually to take a step back, to not push and strive every single day, but to actually allow us a sense of rest and a sense of comfort and a, a sense of resilience. I love the whole concept of putting out these challenges and opportunities for people because it is through those consistent actions that we build the muscle, just like you're building a muscle or stamina as you're practicing for your triathlon. And at the same time, I feel like it's this incredible double benefit. While we're building the muscle on one side, on the other side, we're benefiting by all of the conversations and connections and learning that happen when we do these things. For me, to take that to a concrete point, when you walk into a, a coffee shop and you buy a cup of coffee for the person behind you and have a conversation, you're stepping into this moment of discomfort, but you're also stepping into a moment of service. You're doing something for somebody else and you're connecting with them in a way that feels really authentic and real. And I cannot tell you, and I put some of these examples in the book, we have had Scare Your Soul participants who have found business partners doing this. We've had participants who have connected with people who grew up in small towns in the, at the same time or whose mothers grew up in small towns together. We've had people make connections that have created lifelong friendships all through that little push through the barrier. So I really think like many of your listeners may have a meditation practice or a gratitude practice or a, a health or nutrition practice. If your listeners just adopted a very simple courage practice, find one thing every day that scares you. Those eight words I wrote on the airplane that fateful day, that I cannot tell you the riches that can come from that. And once you do it, you again, start to build that muscle. And it's not the big things jumping out of planes. It's the small things. It's the smiling at a stranger. I was with my son the other day and we left a restaurant. We had wanted to go to a special pizza place and he had three slices of pizza and he was so excited to take them home. And we walked out and there was a homeless man standing right outside the restaurant. He looked at him, walked up to him, said hello and handed him the pizza that we had just walked out with. Tiny moment, right? Tiny, but beautiful and powerful. And I'm just so passionate about the fact that this is a way of life that will create such passion in everybody that wants to lead a more flourishing life and wants to grow. An example of this that I like to talk about, and forgive me if you're a regular listener because I've talked about it a lot, but my long-term mentor is former astronaut, Captain Wendy Lawrence. And she loves to talk about the concept that we have to give ourselves permission to dream our dream. And she finds as she was an astronaut going out and talking to so many youth across the world that so many people today 
give up at the first impact of negativity or fear or adversity that comes across them. And she likes to tell her story that she watched the astronauts landing on the moon and that was the impetus for her wanting to become an astronaut. And from that time forward, she took daily actions all throughout her life. And that's what people always ask her, how did you become an astronaut? She said it was the thousands upon tens of thousands of choices of taking herself closer to the things that she knew were necessary to get her to her end goal that allowed her to accomplish it. And it's what so many people fail to do today, and I'm not preaching here, I've done it myself, is we run into things and instead of allowing ourselves to get over that hurdle, we end up giving up or taking an easier path. And I think it's through these challenges as you talk about and taking these steps that we end up having the courage to get to the end destination that we aspire to be. So I'd love to tell you just on the topic of dreams and on the topic of stepping through fear, especially when it really is its most intense, I'd love to tell you just a quick story about one of our first Scare Your Soul participants. Her name is Johanna. She grew up in Beverly Hills, California. Her dad was an agent and her mom was a writer. And she loved to perform. She just absolutely loved to make people laugh. And she has this incredible laugh and incredible energy. She's just an absolute delight to be with. And when she would go to Lakers games with her dad, he would watch the Lakers, makes sense. And she was enthralled with cheerleaders. She just thought they had so much enthusiasm and energy and talent. And she really made a commitment to herself at a really young age to be a cheerleader. She has told me this story many times, and I know it well. She did not have the body type in those days that was conducive to being a cheerleader in her school. She was not allowed to be part of that group and then moved to a school where there were no cheerleaders. When I met Johanna, she was 53, a cancer survivor, a mother of three, and a nurse and was going through a terrible time. She had achieved a success over cancer, but she was tired and exhausted. And she came to me and said, I need to do a scare your soul challenge. I need to do something that is going to help me bounce back, help me to be happier. And I said to her, I want you to think about something that would light you up, that would unlock something. And she called me back and said, I am freaking out. I called the athletic director of the largest high school in our town. And I asked him if I could be a cheerleader for a day with the 17 and 18 year old cheerleaders. Fortunately for her, he loved the idea and so did the girls. And she spent a week practicing, tumbling, learning the cheers. And here's where I think the crux of this story exists. The day of the homecoming game, which was the game that she was gonna cheer at, she was pinning her hair up in the bathroom and had an absolute crisis of confidence. She thought to herself, I literally, I can't do this. Who at 53 years old becomes a cheerleader? But there was something in her that said, just do it, just push through. And so she ran out onto the field with these other girls, 2000 people in the stands. And she turned around at midfield to see a standing ovation. All of the people in the stands had been told about her scare your soul challenge and people were in tears supporting her it was maybe one of the best days of her entire life it just required her to push through that fear and i will tell you that she has good days and she has bad days but the photo that is most prominent on her phone is the photo that shows two football players who asked to take a photo with her after she had done her cheerleading routine it inspires other people and it inspires us when we push through fear like this. What a tremendous accomplishment, but it was something that changed her life in a positive way and it changed all of our lives because we heard all about it from her. And that I think is so much of the magic of this work is when you share courageous stories with one another, there's this huge burst of inspiration and connectedness that occurs. And I will always thank Johanna for sharing that experience and sharing that story with us. Well, speaking of courageous, I love the fact that you brought up Abraham Lincoln when you discussed the topic of courageous action. 
And I love it, maybe not for the reason that the listener is going to think of initially, but because of the fact for much of his life, until he was in his mid-30s, President Lincoln was actually devoid of meaning, self-described himself as a piece of driftwood moving aimlessly through life. And it wasn't until he moved from safety and into a forward position of growth and taking on something that he felt was so worth pursuing, even if it cost him his reputation, everything about him. And it was that desire to push for growth that led us to remember him the way that we do today as the greatest president of the United States. My question to you is, why must we, like President Lincoln and the woman that you just brought up, choose courageous action towards growth again and again? Sure. I was speaking the other day at a, a large bank and I was waiting beforehand to go in and, and I was sitting at their cafe that they have in this in huge skyscraper and talking to the woman who is behind the counter. I ordered a cup of coffee and we were chatting. I said, how long have you been here? And she said, oh my gosh, 30 years. I've been here for 30 years. And it seems like it has gone by in a day. It has flown by. That concept, I think, is something that should motivate all of us. Life flies by. Any of us who have kids and have seen them grow, or pets and have seen them grow, sometimes we look back at our photos and we say, I cannot believe that was nine years ago or 10 years ago. What I want for myself and what I really want for everybody else is not to have a life that flies by. I want a life that is full of intense adventures, and memories, and hard times, and joys. I want the friction, and I want the tension, and I want the grit that comes along with leading a passionate life. And to me, it is something that only occurs when you enter that growth zone. When we stay in our comfort zone, and I give so many tools in the book about how to push out of that comfort zone, and really why the comfort zone exists in the first place, which is to keep us in homeostasis and to keep us safe and to keep us comfortable and out of danger. But for many of us, we're not in danger on a daily basis. We're really just holding ourselves back with those fears. So if we can push forward, as you said, Abraham Lincoln, again and again, we're not going to have that conversation where we have to say 30 years has gone by in a flash. We can actually say, oh my gosh, do you know the week I've had? I cannot tell you the things that I did this week. I did this and I did this and this was hard and this was a great outcome and I met this new person or I learned this new idea. Wow, don't we all want that life? And to me, you could go out and buy 600 books and listen to 2000 podcasts and get great ideas. But the basis for it all, I believe, is can you push out of your comfort zone every single day push through those fears that you think you need to pay attention to, but really are just holding you back and lead that life so that you can look back and say, maybe I wasn't Abraham Lincoln, but I was the best me that I possibly can be. And I don't want anything less than that. I really don't. I want to live that life and nothing less. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I thought it was useful that we might go through a couple of the tools that you recommend in the book. One of them that I liked came in chapter three, where you talk about the power of dreams and what they tell us. Can you discuss the challenge you do called a dream table? <laughs> sure. So in Scare Your Soul, we're both virtual and we're physical. And every once in a while, we have a number of ambassadors and I join a couple of our ambassadors and we set up a table in front of a coffee shop. And we normally have the coffee shop give us a bunch of free coffee coupons, which we put on the table. And we wait until people walk by and we smile and we say hello. And sometimes they come up to our dream table. And what we ask them is the following. We say, what is one dream that you've always had but has not been fulfilled? And you see this incredible look on their face. Most of them like look upwards into the sky and they start talking about things like, I always wanted to start my own company. I always wanted to take six months off and travel through Europe. I always wanted to study to become a nurse. And it's amazing to see what people say and it's lively and it's positive. But then we ask the following, 
and we say, you get a free cup of coffee when you answer the second part. What is one thing that you can do today that would move you towards that goal? And I have had some of the richest conversations with people who start off by saying, oh, I can't do that. No way. Don't have the money, don't have the time, don't have the education. I have too many people around me that wouldn't allow me to do it. I'm not good enough. I'm not fast enough. I'm not thin enough. The obstacles, the fears begin to arrive. And what I like to do is to take it one step further. And I'll give you just a quick example. I had a young woman approach me and I said to her, what is the one thing that you've always wanted to do? And she said, I want to be a philanthropist. I would love at some point to just give away money to people who need it. And I said, great. So what's one thing that you can do today? And she said, well, I can't. I'm a struggling student. I don't have the money. Philanthropists need money and I will never be that. And I said, actually, you are. You're going to start right now because I'm going to hand you this stack of coffee coupons, free coffee coupons. And I want you to walk down the street and I want you to hand them out to whomever you like because you don't need to let your own fear or your own reticence or your own self-talk stop you. Being a philanthropist isn't about the dollar amount. It's about the intent. It's about where it's coming from in your heart. And all of a sudden I handed her these coupons and she timidly walked down the street and I could see how nervous she was. And finally someone coming the other way, she handed them this coupon and they smiled. And she ended up, I think, having one of the best days that she had that year. It is these small actions. Can you get past that first feeling of can't do it, won't do it, not allowed to do it, afraid to do it, to actually say going to do it? And that to me is the key. That's what these dream tables are all about. Yes, I often say that the hardest choice we ever have to make is the first choice. And that is to take that first action that leads us to chasing that dream we want to go. And so often it's that hesitance before taking that step that curtails so many dreams from becoming real. So thank you for sharing that. Another challenge I was hoping you could talk about is earlier this week, I happened to interview Hal Hirschfield, who some people may know, he's a professor at the Anderson School of Business at UCLA. And we discussed his new book coming out called Future Self. And one of the challenges he says that helps us get us closer to our future selves is writing a letter to our future self. I understand in the book, you have a similar philosophy, but you suggest writing it about feelings and values. I do. First of all, there are so many wonderful benefits of writing a letter to yourself, and it clarifies so much. Very few people say, dear self, I hope you have that new Ferrari, and I hope you got that title that you were looking for, and that salary bump, I hope you got it. We don't write about those things. It's almost like David Brooks talking about the difference between resume values and eulogy values, that do you lead your life based on the kind of things that are going to contribute to your resume, or do you lead your life based on the kind of things that someone's going to say about you at your funeral? I would much rather lead my life in the way that people are going to talk about me at my funeral. To me, values are the key to the action that we lead in our lives. And so many people say to me, you've got all these, you have so many courage practices in this book and ways for me to commit myself to a courageous life. Where do I start? And to me, it always starts with values. It's the understanding of what drives us internally. What do we value most as an individual? And then letting our actions flow from that. So I do have a part of the book where I walk people through how to write a letter to yourself. It's actually the last part of the last chapter. And my hope is that they had done enough work through the course of the book that they really feel aware, they feel positive and active, and they're ready now to look off into the future. I have done this every single year. These letters actually become almost like treasures. It's the kind of thing that if you had to grab one or two things leaving your house, this may be something that you would grab because it is you at your essence. It's you planning the things that are most important to you. And when we do that and we kind of look off into the future, it honestly allows these small challenges to not seem so big anymore. These things that we do every day, all of a sudden they seem like, aha, I can do that because I have a larger goal in mind. And when you write yourself a letter, it actually concretizes those views and those wishes that we have for ourselves. 
Uh, I love that. And another way I've heard that you can do this is I had a gentleman who was one of my first guests named Trav Bell, who calls himself the bucket list guy, but he has an exercise that he calls the reverse bucket list. And sometimes people don't feel the courage to move forward in their lives. And so what he suggests you do is you look back on all the things in your life that you've accomplished that you never thought you possibly could and write yourself a letter about them and how they made you feel. Because when you look back and you see all the insurmountable things that you've done, it really helps to give you a foundation to do the things that you want to accomplish further on in your life. So I think both of those are great techniques. This whole sense of looking back and looking forward is so powerful. There's a part of the book that I call a life timeline, and it actually says year by year, what was one milestone in that year where you really did something courageous? And most people think, oh, I'm not going to be able to fill this out. Too many lines, too many years. And the reality is once you get started and you realize, oh my gosh, I did this, or I went here, or I created a new life here. Or, I had this thing that happened to me. I was so resilient and I did this. And then you start to see it compounding and compounding. And you take that and you combine it with a, a value-based look into the future. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that to me is a recipe for confidence. It's a recipe for courage. And it really sets the stage for leading this kind of life that I really advocate in the book. Well, Scott, we can't uh, get to the end of this interview without you talking about the seven principles for leading a scare your soul life. Can you please just go over them for us? As I've done, worked in Scare Your Soul now for so many years, I tried to figure out what are the areas of courage that are the most powerful, the ones that I have found that most people see the greatest amount of growth in as they are moving forward. And I chose seven, and I chose them because I believe they're the things that if we consistently do them, they are really going to lead to this flourishing life. The first is one that I referred to before, and that is gratitude. Um, I've had a gratitude partner for seven years. Every night we text each other five gratitudes, have been doing it for seven years. And there is something that requires a ton of courage to be grateful in this world. And I go deep into gratitude in this book. It's one of my favorite topics, and I'm sure a favorite topic of many of your listeners. But to approach gratitude from a position of courage, what does that look like? What does it feel like? The next is adventure. What is it like to lead an adventurous life? Even if we're leading lives where we don't hop on a plane and fly somewhere, what does it mean to lead an adventurous life by walking out of our own front door? Where's adventure in nature, in relationships? What does it mean to lead a vibrant, adventurous life? The third is all about energy. That's mind-body. What does it mean to be courageous with our own bodies, taking care of ourselves and taking care of our own brains and mindsets? The next one is curiosity, which is... In my mind, one of the greatest keys to connection, but curiosity in many ways requires courage. Do we have the courage to listen? Do we have the courage to connect on a deep level? I go through in the book a long and hopefully powerful story about Arthur Aaron's 36 questions and an experience I had on a second date that led me to a lifelong friendship by being curious with somebody else. It was an amazing experience. The fifth principle is all about awe. Can we be courageous in how we see ourselves related to nature, related to God or transcendence or the universe? What does that look like and how can we be courageous in doing that? And then the last two, I think, are two of really the most essential. One is about forgiveness. Um, in many cases, I believe that this may be the toughest set of challenges in the book. Can we be courageous enough to forgive? Critical issue as we are moving towards a happier, more flourishing life. And then finally, an issue that many of us deal with, and that is how to be courageous in our work or our volunteer life or our level of creation. When we create things or when we work and create things in the world, how can we be courageous as we enter or live that work world? How can we ask for a raise? How can we speak up for ourselves? And how can we create things in this world more courageously so that everyone benefits? Um, those are the seven principles and each one of them in the book has writing prompts and real challenges. And I tell stories in each chapter, both from my life and from others' lives, that I hope will help provide extra inspiration so that people can really dig in, do these challenges, and really start leading a more courageous life in these seven areas. 
Yes, and I wanted to touch on the forgiveness one because I think one of the most important things for people to understand, if you're wanting to forgive others, you first have to forgive yourself. And I think it's one of the hardest things that people go through is showing themselves self-kindness because there are so many things that transpire in our lives that we hold an internal grudge about. And until we're able to let those things go, let those stuck points out, it becomes very difficult to forgive others unless we do that. So I think that, as you brought up, is an extremely important one. My dear friend and mentor, Professor Tal ben Shahar, who's a leading authority in the field of positive psychology, always talks about the permission to be human. Can we allow ourselves the grace and the permission to feel emotions, to make mistakes, to do the kind of things that we all do every day and really make us human, that to allow our perfectionistic tendencies to drift away and to really just allow emotions to flow through us. That allows us, I completely agree, to be able to move to a place of forgiveness. And I think that in many ways, for those who are listening, who feel that they're a little mired in anger or bitterness, something has happened to them, they've been wronged in some way. I hope that I give some tools to be able to allow us to forgive those people that have wronged us, even in a way where they don't need to be present and part of the conversation, which I think is a really intriguing part of forgiveness. We oftentimes think that we have to sit next to somebody and tell them face to face that we forgive them and have a conversation about it, that there are ways to forgive in our heart and to take our own power back. And to me, that is outrageously courageous. Well, as Scott mentioned throughout the seven areas, he brings up different challenges. He's talked about a few of them here already under adventure. He talked about the exercise of lifeline under curiosity. He talked about engaging in coffee conversations in energy. There are exercises around how do you create an energized week, et cetera. So they're very sound steps that you can take that will allow you to help take action on this course of leading a more courageous life. Scott, I recently interviewed Dacker Keltner, and if you're not familiar with him, he's a famed professor at Berkeley who's been studying human emotion and compassion and awe for most of his career. And through his research, and he recently published a book, but he believes that awe is the thing that brings us the most fulfilled or self-realized life. And I did want to ask you a follow-on question about awe, and that is, what is the power of getting awestruck? Oh my gosh. Awe, I think, is one of those things that gets short shrift when we think about the kind of work that we can and should be doing in this world. We are so focused on our phones. We're so focused on things that have instant gratification that we oftentimes lose sight of just the power of walking in nature of going to a museum and seeing a beautiful work of art, of, of listening to a powerful piece of music. Dacker has done literally, I think, some of the greatest work in, in the world on this topic. And, and awe has this kind of duality of it where we feel in one way very small. There's something that is so much larger and more significant than us. So it takes us out of our person-centered, ego-centered viewpoints, which is very powerful but it also connects us. So it has this incredible duality. I'm sure he talked about this of feeling small and feeling a sense of awe, but at the same time, feeling deeply connected to nature, to other people, to history, to our ancestors and to the people that will follow us. What an incredibly powerful way to walk in this world, to have a sense of awe. It's almost like we're turning back to a child where a child will run outside at recess and look around and just smile and run, that when we have and cultivate that sense of awe, we're leading our lives that way. And boy, what an incredible way to lead our lives. Who doesn't want to walk outside and just marvel? So can we cultivate that practice? Absolutely. Does it take some practice and sometimes some courage? It does. But boy, is it worth it. And it was interesting because out of all those ways that you can find awe, those were things that we talked about, but he said that the simplest way and the most common way that people find awe 
is when they observe others doing acts of empathy, acts of courage, or acts of compassion to others. And I found that so powerful because that's something that each of us can feel awe in each and every day as we observe others perform those acts. It's almost like a multiplier effect. When you see people, when you have a passion for a courageous life and other people doing it the same, they are inspiring you and you're inspiring them. There's this beautiful sense of awe in somebody. And we all see this, right? We've seen people step up into moments of truth and moments of courage. And of course it inspires us. It gives us a sense of awe and it gives us a sense of possibility. And to me, that is such a huge part of this work. There's so much energy around it. We just have to pay attention and we have to take action. And Scott, I'm going to end on this question. We've talked a lot today and you've given some incredible examples and information. If you're a listener sitting on this podcast today and you've reached this far in the interview, what do you think is the most important choice a listener can make today if they want to change their current predicament? It's exactly what I wrote in my Mead Spiral Notebook on that airplane. Do one thing every day that scares you. Find one moment, not 10, not 20, and they can be micro, they can be so small, but one moment where you feel some butterflies in your stomach or a tightness in your chest or your shoulders, and you know that something is gonna push you. If you can start leading your life with a post-it note on your mirror that says, do one thing every day that scares you, you will start to achieve levels of connection, of joy, of learning, of growth. You're going to succeed. You're going to fail. You're going to do it all, but you're going to be leading a flourishing life. So eight words, do one thing every day that scares you. Okay. And then lastly, if a listener wanted to become part of the Scare Your Soul movement, where's the best place for them to go? Sure. Our website is scareyoursoul.com. We have a free weekly challenge that comes out in our newsletter. We share stories. We share prompts. I love quotes. as So I always share quotes. I hope that are inspiring of courage. And the book, which just came out, and I'm so proud of, is available at bookstores everywhere. Well, Scott, thank you so much for giving us the honor of coming on today. I really enjoyed this conversation, and it hits right in the bullseye for what we try to do on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. It was a pleasure. What an incredible interview with Scott Simon. And I wanted to thank Scott and Hachat Books for the honor and privilege of having them appear on the show. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Struck podcast interview that I did with Dr. Gloria Mark, who is the Chancellor's Professor of Informatics at the University of California, Irvine. She is the author of the book, Multitasking in the Digital Age. And we also discuss her latest book, Attention Span, Finding Focus and Fighting Distraction. We let our goals slip. That's the main thing. Our goals have slipped. And when our goals have slipped, we're open to any kind of distracting force in the environment. The way to stay on track is to be goal-oriented, and then you can be in control. We can all be in control of where we direct our attention. That's the real challenge for us in this digital age. The fee for this show is that you share it with family or friends when you find something useful or interesting. If you know someone who could use Scott Simon's inspirational message, then please share this show with them because the greatest compliment that you can give us is to share this show with those that you love and care about. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. Now go out there and be passion struck. Passion struck.